Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Programs Committee of the Green Mountain Audubon Society, I would like to welcome you to our presentation tonight. Our presentation is the first of four programs, which will be given by our presenter. This one will be followed by one February 9th about gear talk. In a moment, I'll introduce our presenter and I will give you an idea how we're going to run the session. Um, at this point, we um, have about 35 of you and we're very, very happy on this night to have you join us. My friend and mentor, Mav Kim, will be our presenter for our four-part series, the first of which we will see this evening. Mav, I have known for 30 to 40 years. I taught both of her daughters and I called her on June of 2008 and told her that I wanted to become a birder. And from there to here, it has been an adventure. Mav has written articles for Birdwatching Magazine. She's written two novels. She has been teaching for Ollie and also CBU Evening Division for many years now. I'm sure that among those who are witnessing this presentation, we have some of her students. Her presentation is slated to last an hour and a half. During the presentation, if you have a question, please open up the chat part of this and type in your question directly. When Mav finishes her presentation, we will begin asking her those questions. At that point, we will unmute everybody and we will continue this in a question and answer format. So without any further ado, I would like to present to you our presenter, Mav Kim. Mav. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Green Mountain Audubon Society. So bird watching or birding is one of the fastest growing pastimes in North America. A few years back, the Vermont, or the, rather the U.S. Fish and Wildlife did a, a survey and they found out that something like 45 million people identified themselves as bird watchers, which brings in a lot of money, something like 80 billion a year to the U.S. economy. All over the country, people are staring out their windows, grabbing their binoculars every time they go somewhere. Um, jumping in their cars to see birds that other people have seen. Um, talking about birds, learning about birds, joining up with other birders. So what's going on? The populations of a lot of bird species, sorry, that keeps happening. I will make it stop happening in just a minute. I hope. The population of many bird species is going down dramatically, actually. And the population, aha, I see what I'm doing. The populations of people around the globe are spending time looking at and learning about and sharing information about birds. Part of the reason is that um, a lot of people have time. For most of human history, most people lived like other animals do. Most of every single day was dedicated to survival, to finding food, to finding protection, to finding um, uh, shelter. And humans lived like that too. Sure, many humans looked around and they saw the birds around them and they knew them as something other than just food, but still they didn't have time to actually study them or enjoy them because they were too intent on survival. But taken as a species, we are now living longer and have more freedom from immediate want than at any time in human history. Of course, that's not the truth for every person living on earth today, but it is for millions. And an extraordinary number of people now have hobbies, pastimes, passions that have absolutely nothing to do with survival. Now the most intrepid or dedicated, or we might call them driven birders, will go anywhere and stand anywhere to watch birds. They will stand next to smelly sewage treatment ponds. They will stand uh, next to the, um, I'm having serious problems getting organized here. There we go. They will stand next to garbage dumps. They will stand on this windswept rock face <clears throat> right beside Hudson Bay it was June and the temperature was 40 degrees. These are dedicated birders. So there's gotta be something about this. 
This evening we'll talk about how to get started with birding, what skills you will develop, what um, equipment you'll want, and where to see birds. And we'll also see photos of many of the uh, birds that you're most likely to see here in Chittenden County, Vermont. And we'll talk about some of the rewards, both physical and psychological of birding, which may include stress reduction, lower blood pressure, improved attention, improved focus, and, and camaraderie, which is a big part of birding. And also just plain fun. There are so many reasons why so many people, young and old, are taking to the fields and the woods and the beaches and the marshes to look at birds. Well, my goal is to get you excited about birding if you're new to birding and excited about birds and even more, maybe to make you even more interested in habitat protection than you already are. So we can all together keep Vermont being beautiful and full of bird song. For most people, the first place they bird is their own backyard. And most people recognize some common backyard birds like blue jays and black capped chickadees like this little cutie who's clutching a peanut, getting ready to chip it and eat it. They find themselves looking forward to the springtime return of birds like red-winged blackbirds. Or maybe the first time that they notice a robin on their lawn in the spring. Or maybe their very first view of a, of a great blue heron in the spring. Setting up bird feeders is the next early step in the development of most birders. Watching feeders gives people an intimate view of birds. It gets us to know birds on a sort of personal level. People might even get to recognize individual birds like this cardinal that was in the process of molting and looked like that for weeks. Or maybe this black capped chickadee who was, strangely, white capped. And when totally unfamiliar birds show up at a black backyard feeder, even the most uninterested birder finds himself wondering, what are they? Where do they come from? How long will they stay? Why are they here? Other people get interested in adding bird boxes or nesting boxes to their yards. Of course, not everybody goes to this extreme. This is a uh, right near White's Beach in South Hero, and these are only a few of the man's six or 700 bird boxes. But even if we don't go to that extreme, bird boxes, like bird feeders, tend to proliferate. We now have a dozen um, roosting and nesting boxes on our 1.3 acres, ranging in size for some for the tiniest chickadees and some for the largest woodpeckers. At about this time in most birders' life, they encounter a spark bird. That was a term coined by the famous Roger Torrey Peterson, the first man who made a field guide that allowed complete beginners to go out into the woods or the, or the fields and make a stab, a good stab, at identifying the birds they saw there. A spark bird is the bird that turns you from casual observer to dedicated bird watcher. It's different for every person. It can't be planned for. Spark lands in exactly the right place and you're hooked. I read a really good a line recently. It said, a spark bird is a miracle that gives you new eyes. I was somewhat interested in birds as a teenager, but I think the spark happened when I started seeing ring-necked pheasants next to our house in rural New York State. One day, my two little daughters and I saw the male walking across the field right in back of the house. A few days later, we saw a female. And about two weeks later, we saw the female and eight little chicks in back of her. Big, showy, colorful birds like this ring-necked pheasant tend to be spark birds more than, say, sparrows. And my partner's Bernie's uh, spark bird was also bright colored. One day he was out canoeing and a very noisy, bright blue bird came right in front of him, his boat, landed on a tree, and then a few minutes later, dove straight down into the water and came up with a fish. And to this day, belted kingfishers are one of his favorite birds. 
This photo, by the way, shows well um, why my sister, I've got to figure out how this, why this isn't working well. This, there we go. Shows why my sister, when she was very, very young, my sister Susie used to call these, those birds with the messy hair. Buying a pair of binoculars or a field guide or an app for your phone signals the next step, a growing interest in birds and birding. And for a great many birders, keeping the binoculars and the field guide next to their kitchen window and just watching and enjoying the birds in the backyard will be the extent of their hobby and a very, very enjoyable hobby it is. But other birders find themselves wanting to team up with other, others so they don't have to try to identify everything by themselves. They might join the local Audubon chapter or the Green Mountain Audubon Society, or they might hear about a nearby birding festival and go find out what it's like. A small percentage of birds become, a birders rather, become crazed. I know one man who went out of state for a, a family wedding. The church was very close to the airport, the plane got in on time, and he missed the whole ceremony. And he explained later, well, there was a really great sewage treatment pond between the airport and the, and the church. In England, the word for crazed birders is twitcher. A twitcher will go many, many, many miles, hundreds of miles sometime, to see one bird, hope that it's still there, that other birders have reported. Well, the United States has its share of twitchers also. Let me tell you a story. In June 2000, a lovely woman named B was sitting in a field in Kings, near Kingsland Bay in, in um, Ferrisburg, Vermont. B, I think, was in her 90s at that time. And she had been a knowledgeable and passionate birder for decades. Well, this day, Bird, B looked up and she saw a fork-tailed flycatcher. Fork-tailed flycatchers should be in Belize, not in Ferrisburg, Vermont. Well, fortunately, this extraordinary sighting stuck around until she could get home and notify other birders. In fact, the bird was around for more than a month. And people came to see this poor lost fork-tailed flycatcher from all over New England, New York, Eastern Canada, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. And one couple actually flew up from Florida. They got in, took South, South Burlington Airport. They rented a car. They drove down Route 7. They hung around for a while. They finally got to see the bird. They got back in their car, drove back up Route 7, found a place to eat, found a place to sleep, and they were on the plane the next morning at 6 a.m. heading back for Florida. They were twitchers. Well, most of us will never be crazed, <laughs> but anyone here, anyone can be a bird watcher. So what do you need to get started? Well, first, you need interest and curiosity and the understanding that almost nobody starts from scratch. We've already seen some birds that most Vermonters recognize, uh, blue jays, robins, chickadees, great blue herons. Almost everyone recognizes mallards. In fact, even little tiny kids recognize mallards because of the book, Make Way for Ducklings. Almost everybody recognizes Canada geese. And I love this sort of nonchalant straw chewing behavior of this one. <laughs> Most people know morning doves, even though they might get them mixed up sometimes with their cousins' uh, pigeons. And everybody knows wild turkeys, and they can't be mixed up with anything. Vermont has several woodpeckers, and that family of birds may be the first that many children learn. And the pileated, or pileated, it's right both ways, um, is the biggest and the most dramatic one in the state. This bird is the original woody woodpecker with its red crest and its manic sounding laugh. And I'll bet just about everybody knows what an adult bald eagle looks like with its white head and white tail. This species was in danger of becoming extinct because of the effects of the pesticide DDT. And years after DDT was banned, there were still no bald eagles in Vermont. So um, eaglets were brought in from Maryland and Massachusetts and raised by volunteers who are wearing eagle hand puppets. And now they have really taken off. These huge birds can be seen throughout the Champlain and Connecticut River Valleys. There are several nesting pairs in the state. 
and they turn out about two dozen eaglets every single year. Here's another well-known and widely recognized species that was also almost killed off by DDT. Common loons were brought back by intense efforts on the part of uh, dedicated citizens and scientists. And actually the reduction in the use of lead shot has helped also. And everybody would recognize that this bird is an owl, even though not everyone would know what kind of an owl. And this bird and this picture is a good example of the fact that birds are everywhere, not just where we expect to find them. This bird, this was at noon one day, and the bird was right next to one of the trails at the Shelburne uh, Bay Park. Now, after the interest and curiosity and the understanding that you already know many birds, you need time, but you don't necessarily need a huge amount of time. Even in the busiest or craziest schedule, you can find 10 minutes three or four times a week to stand by a window and look at feeders or to look into a, a cedar hedge or shrubs looking for movement or to scan the skies. And you don't have to go outside of the state to bird watch. You don't even have to go to many of the beautiful hot birding hotspots here in Vermont. There are birds everywhere and we are lucky there's good habitat almost everywhere. Your own backyard might easily host over 100 species a year. In 2020, we tallied 115 bird species in our Jericho uh, Center backyard and neighborhood. And if you get in the habit of watching birds, paying attention to birds that are around you every day, you'll start noticing behaviors, activities that birds do. You'll notice courtship behaviors, finding food, territorial battles, nest building, feeding young. One Burlington woman was astonished to see a small dark heron in what she described as our tiny backyard with the ancient thinning cedar hedge. Well, it turned out to be a green heron and they saw the one, she and her husband, and then they saw a second, and then they saw a third, and they ended up seeing six altogether, six green herons in a little tiny Burlington backyard. These birds are much more often seen in ponds like this or next to streams. And she and her husband got to watch the, the young herons hiding in the cedar hedge all around in different places while the adults went from place to place bringing them food. And I wonder how many other people have had fascinating and surprising birds just outside their windows and haven't even noticed them. So how does one go about bird watching. Well, if you just want to sit and watch and enjoy and not bother with trying to identify what you're seeing, you're all set. <laughs> but most people do want to know the names of the birds they're seeing. <clears throat> and there are many clues that can help us identify them. That last one on there, sound, what birds make sound, what sounds, how birds make sound, make sound is the habitat to try to figure out what bird we're seeing. Color is really important, by the way. Oops, I'm sorry, let's, use, let's discuss size first. <clears throat> In general, very broadly, birds can be thought of as a lot bigger than a robin, close to a robin in size, a little bit smaller than a robin, and a lot smaller than a robin. A few years ago, I made up this ideas chart um, to sort of help people know where to start looking in their, in their um, field guides. And so if a bird is a lot bigger than a robin, you can look at what is it doing right now? Is it soaring? Is it standing in the water? What, is it build, what does its bill look like? And if a bird is close to a robin in size, again, you can look at the bill, you can look at its behavior, and you can know where to turn to look in your, in your bird book to find out what you're seeing. If you're watching a bird that's smaller than a robin and you see it constantly just swooping through the air, well then you just turn your bird guide to swifts and swallows because the bird's behavior and size has given you a hint as to where to look and what, what kind of bird it might be. 
a wonderful woman who's taken several of my classes um, neatly made this, this chart, both in a big version and then a smaller one that folds into a pocket or fits in a field guide. And if anyone wants one, I think um, you can contact me through Green Mountain Audubon Society and I'll um, email you a PDF. Well, color is really important to birds. Color helps birds identify others of their own species. It helps female birds decide on the health and vitality of um, possible mates, the fathers of their possible children. <clears throat> and color helps humans categorize birds too. If we're birding in Vermont and a bird flashes by that looks mostly red, it is most probably a northern cardinal. Unless we're right in the middle of the woods and it's summertime, and then we might be seeing a, a scarlet tanager. And if we see blue, we think blue jay if it's big, good sized, but if it's smaller than a robin, it might be a bluebird, or it might be an indigo bunting. Color alone, though, isn't the only thing we can go by for several reasons. First, a lot of species change color during the year. American goldfinches are a great example. These pretty little birds are around in Vermont all year round. And in the summer, the males are dressed in beautiful lemon yellow and, and charcoal, or more than charcoal gray, dense black and bright white. But in the winter, both the males and the females are alike in sort of a dull um, ochre color and, and dark yellows and um, olive. A second count confounding factor is that in many species, males and females look different. They have different colors. This is called sexual dimorphism and it's both common and logical. Females of many bird species are drabber. They're, they have browns and grays that help them stay hidden when they're on the nest. And the male's flashy colors can actually lead predators away from the nest and also, of course, help attract females. Here are male and female red-winged blackbirds and male and female uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks. And in many species, immature birds are colored differently from adults. Here's an immature rose-breasted grosbeak, hatched the same year that his portrait was taken. And to make things even more confusing, and another reason why we can't count on color, is that oddities can happen in the bird world. Some birds, individual birds, can have more or less melanin, the pigment that darkens hair, or eyes, or skin, or feathers. They have more or less than is typical for their species, so they come out not the usual color. That this goldfinch at the bottom was leucistic, meaning it had much less melanin than most goldfinches. And that sweet little puffball of white up there was a common everyday house sparrow that had almost no melanin at all. And to make things even more confusing, hybrids can happen. A few years ago, we spent ages watching this pretty little bird at our fears. It looked like a dark-eyed junco, sort of, but not quite. About two years after we watched the bird, we found out that it was actually a hybrid between a dark-eyed junco and a white-throated sparrow, something we didn't even know ever could happen. So color is helpful at identifying birds. The size is helpful, but it's not all we need. We also get helped by behavior. Behavior often provides clues to identify birds. Here are just a few examples. Some birds fly in a straight line just as if they're shot out of an arrow. But woodpeckers, the whole woodpecker family, make sort of large lazy swoops in the air. It's almost as if they take one, they beat their wings once and then they just sort of relax for a little while and dip and then they beat their wings again. Goldfinches make very much tighter swoops in the air. Um, they at the bottom of every single swoop, they make a little noise that sounds like potato chip, potato chip. Some really big birds just soar, making lazy circles in the sky, including hawks and eagles, ravens and vultures. And if you see a, a soaring bird like this one, with the wings held in a V, and the bird barely moving, just tipping everything, 
about behavior helping with identification. And I said that if birds are cutting down a tree trunk, they're very often one of our white our nuthatches, like this white-breasted nuthatch. But if they're going up a tree trunk, they're a brown creeper. Brown creepers circle up around a tree looking for insects under the bark. And when they get to the top, they zip line down to the bottom of another tree and start up all over again. And I have to mention one Vermont bird that has instantly recognizable behavior. American bitterns freeze if they feel they're threatened at all. They point their beaks up toward the bill. They, they make their body very, very tight and tough, tight and hard rather, and the stripes on their front merge beautifully with the cattails or reeds. That's their usual location. This bird, by the way, was not in a usual location. It was hanging out next to the parking lot at the visitor center of Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge. And it was there to help celebrate International Migratory Bird Day. I think that's what he was doing. So in addition to color and size, shape, behavior, birders also get clues to help with bird identification from the time of the year. We expect different birds at different times of the year. Some birds live their whole lives here in Vermont. They're hatched here, they raise their young here. Other birds use our state for courtship and nesting and feeding young. And that can last as long as a half year for some species, but only three and a half months for other species. And once they're done with those all important tasks, they're out of here. And other kinds of birds just come through the state as they're heading for nesting areas further north. And then when they're done nesting, when they're heading for their wintering areas in the south. And they might spend a few days or as long as several weeks, particularly during fall migration in Vermont, before they start the next journey. They're just fattening up, feeding, and resting before they start the rest of their journey. We can also use habitat to tell what birds we're seeing. Let's say that you see a little brown bird with a thin bill and it's holding its tail cocked up and it's making a chattering, scolding noise. Well, based on the size, which is much smaller than a robin, and the color, a bit of studying, you, you decide that it's probably a wren. If you're standing next to a cattail marsh at that time, you've probably just seen a marsh wren. And if so, you're very lucky because marsh wren are heard much more often than they're seen. But if you're in a, a, a suburban backyard, for instance, you're probably seeing a house wren or perhaps a Carolina wren a species that used to be much further south than we are, but has been gradually expanding its, its um, range northward. Different birds show up in different habitats for various reasons. We don't know, perhaps humans will never know, <laughs> exactly what goes on inside a bird's mind. But having some idea of what birds are looking for can help us know what birds to expect when we're out birding. Let's just talk very briefly about some basic tools that will help you enjoy the birds. We'll talk much more about them in the Gear Talk um, program next Tuesday, I think it is, the 9th. Binoculars are by far the, um, the birders' favorite and most important tool. And there are a lot of specifics about binoculars that you might want to research more before buying some. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss each one of these um, next time you meet. And it's important to know that binoculars are really individual. There are some pairs, some models and, and uh, types that many, many birders love. But still, it's true that it sometimes happens that one birder might never be without a certain kind of binoculars, while another person might just dislike them intensely. And also one specific pair might be too big for someone's hands or not the right fit for their face. A woman who used to come on my bird walk several years ago had a wonderful, absolutely wonderful and extremely expensive pair of binoculars, but they were too big for her tiny face. She could not look through both eyes at once, no matter how tightly she pushed those binoculars together. She had to use the Cadillac binoculars monocularly. So it is a good idea to try binoculars before buying. Unfortunately, here in Vermont, there's no nearby store that has lots of pairs of birding binoculars. 
might find stores that have other kinds of binoculars, but birding binoculars, as we'll talk about next time, are, are different. But the best thing, once COVID is over, is to take walks with other birders and ask to check out their binoculars, see if you can look through them. So what if you've got a pair of binoculars that works for you, your hands, your eyes, etc., and you're getting great looks at, at birds, you might still not know what you're seeing. And that's where a bird guide, a field guide comes in. Many field guides nowadays aren't in the form of books, they're apps. And apps allow birders to carry several field guides around with them without you know, being laden like a pack mule. I have many hardcover, or not hardcover, but book form field guides. But when I go birding, I very often just carry my iPad, and that has two apps on it, two whole field guides right there in my pocket. Once you've got the binoculars that work for you and a good field guide, you're all set. You can watch birds. And remember, you don't have to recognize or identify every single bird you see. As a matter of fact, you don't have to recognize or identify any of them. I keep hearing over and over again, oh, I'm not a good bird watcher, or I'm not very good at this. Well, this is what Ken Kaufman said. He's one of the best bird watchers in the, in the country. He said, birding is something we do for enjoyment. If you enjoy it, then you're a good birder. And if you enjoy it a lot, then you're a great birder. The important thing is to notice birds, to notice the birds that are around you all the time. There are birds everywhere in a city, even in the dead of winter. And so many people walk by birds every single day and don't see them. Several years ago, <clears throat> I led a bird walk in Shelburne and we stopped for a long time to watch two goldfinches bathing in a mud puddle. <laughs> and one woman who had lived in Shelburne her entire life was ecstatic. She kept saying, look at them, they're so beautiful. Are they very rare? They must be rare. Well, they're not, <laughs> they're around all the time. And I was delighted to show her for the first time the goldfinch's beauty. But I was also saddened that she'd lived there for so long among these lovely little birds and had never even seen them. <clears throat> so let's get back to the original question. Why bird watching? Why are so many people watching birds these days? This is the first line of a paper describing so-called nature therapy, or put simply, time spent outdoors. Bird watching gets people outdoors. Time spent outdoors has been associated with stress reduction, lower blood pressure, decreased anxiety, improved attention and focus, and other benefits for um, physical and mental health. An article in the esteemed Journal of Cardiology reported that spending time in nature might also be one way to manage the overinflammation that's associated with autoimmune diseases and might also help with depression, cancer, and other health problems. A study in the journal Affective Disorders concluded that walks in the forest lead to increased excuse me, decreased levels of anxiety and few environmental science and technology reported that getting into nature for even five minutes increases one's self-esteem. Increasing one's self-esteem, we all want that for children. So that's one great reason to get children involved in bird watching. Just look at the expression on this little boy's face as he watches a bird banding demonstration at the Audubon Center in Huntington and gets to see birds like this red-eyed vireo really close. In Shetland, Scotland, doctors actually prescribe nature and bird watching and picking up driftwood on the beach. It's called the Nature Prescription Program. And their website says it recognizes the benefits of nature in reducing blood pressure, reducing anxiety, and increasing overall happiness. The Japanese practice of Shinrin-yoku, or forest bathing, is catching on here in the United States as in other places around the globe. After 15 minutes among trees, people experienced reduced stress, anger, anxiety, 
and depression. Regular forest bathing is related to improved sleep, reductions in the stress hormone cortisol, and strength in immune systems. And walking in nature and bird watching are now recognized as forms of meditation. That incredible concentration and shutting out of everything else that happens when you're watching birds is meditation without effort. This is me, hard at work, practicing birding as meditation. I very much like this quote from an article called My Kind of Birding that appeared in Birdwatcher's Digest. Bird watching requires a patience that slows your pace to the elemental cycles of life. It demands stillness. What are the rewards of this exercise? One, you will have begun to notice things about your surroundings that you never knew existed. And two, this is what I particularly like, you will have wound down your restless inner dynamo to such an extent that you discover a quietude, a stillness within you. Bird watching stimulates the brain. It helps us observe details. It keeps our neurons firing. It helps to form new neural connections in our brains. Birding is perfect for anyone who considers himself or herself a lifelong learner. And going outdoors, moving around, even just strolling at your most leisurely pace has to be better for us than sitting at a desk for hours or binge watching Netflix. And birding at your most leisurely pace often leads to more challenging walking. A good friend of mine, who many of you know, got interested in birds about 10 years ago. At first, he really wanted to see birds, but he told me he didn't really feel like walking great distances to find them. He didn't like flying insects around us, around his head. He didn't much like being outdoors when it was too hot or too cold. Just a few years later, that same man stood with me on the coast of Maine in February, too entranced by harlequin ducks to even feel that icy, icy ocean wind. And he's now climbed a few mountains. And he has slogged miles and miles and miles through wet and hot and humid and buggy jungles and rainforests to look at birds. Well, even if you never go birding in a jungle, or even if you never climb a mountain in hopes of seeing an elusive bicknell's thrush, even if watching birds doesn't immediately lower your blood pressure and act as an anti-inflammatory and help you concentrate and all those other wonderful things that research has indicated it can do, it will still be wonderful in other ways. Paying attention to the wildlife around us puts us in the world, in the natural world. We humans tend to forget that we share the globe with others, with thousands and thousands of species of animals and plants. Every one of those other species can tell us something about the ecosystems they inhabit, the ecosystems we inhabit. Another quote that I really like is this um, from a book called Sightings. Birders are blessed with a special kind of vision of the world. They are unusually susceptible to the emotion of awe. We all, as birders, have latched onto a hobby that keeps us constantly learning, constantly growing, and I like to think eternally young. So let's enjoy some more of the 300, more than 300 species of birds that have been seen in this state. Earlier, we saw a gentle looking common bird. But we also have common birds with attitude. We have sparrows of many different kinds. We have imported birds. There are birds that put on an act, pretending to have a broken wing to lead predators away from their nests. There are birds that can put on a concert, a whole concert, <laughs> imitating other bird songs and even other noises like engines and fires, uh, dogs barking and cats meowing. There are singing finches, although this little beauty wasn't singing, he's busy eating a safflower seed, it looks like. 
And there are birds that astonish us with their colors. Gotta look at these two again, they're just glorious. We've got owls and we've got falcons and we've got hawks. This, little, this beautiful hawk was right outside the kitchen window. We've got gulls and terns and egrets and herons. We have geese. and ducks, this duck hybrid between a mallard and a domestic duck that hung out at the Burlington waterfront for many months a few years ago. We've got super smart crows and ravens. And believe it or not, we've also got shorebirds, even though we are miles and miles and miles, hundreds of miles from the nearest shore, ocean shore. And there are warblers in colors ranging from chestnut to bright red and barn red and chartreuse and sunshine yellow and lemon yellow and sky blue and orange and charcoal gray and densest black. And there are swallows. And we have vireos and thrushes and towhees. And we have the tiniest and probably one of the most welcomed of spring returning migrants, the ruby-throated hummingbird. The return of these little bundles of energy every single spring is always exciting. So why are so many people watching birds nowadays? It's beautiful, it's restful, it's exciting, it's fun, it's diverse, it's educational, it's fun again, it's really fun. Thank you. If anybody would like to pose a question to our presenter, Mav, simply type it in the chat and I will uh, convey it and I will announce it to everybody. Mav, I while have we're to waiting. I apologize for the difficulty. Go ahead. While we're waiting for any questions, because I'm, I'm, as the host, I don't see any being typed right now. Can you give us a preview of, uh, just while we have everybody here, the second, third, and fourth part of the series and what they can expect? And they can always find those dates on the calendar, on the website for the Green Mountain Audubon Society. Right. This series is aimed at new burgers. It's called the New Burger Series. And so this was just an introduction to birding. Next will be gear talk, talking about how to choose and use binoculars, um, field guides, and a lot of apps that are amazing. They connect you with a whole world of other birders, and they also can actually help you identify birds. Um, the third one is um, coming soon to a neighborhood near you. And it's all about spring migration. And we're going to take a look at the birds that will be returning to Vermont, sort of in the same order that they will be returning. And the fourth one is sound. Why and how birds make sound, what sounds they make, and just the amazing um, complexity of bird sound. And I want right now to apologize to the, to the, about the trouble I'm having moving from one slide to the next. I have never, I've done, this is I was mentioning before, I've done over two dozen Zoom presentations and never had difficulty except until these last two, and I don't really know why. So I have read several, watched several Zoom videos, I mean Zoom instruction videos, and I'll watch some more before next Tuesday and try to get that beaten. Oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Okay, we have four questions. The first question is, okay. where does the ruby hummingbird migrate to? Good question. They migrate to, some of them stay in the southern United States and some of them go as far as the Yucatan. Um, so they've got a long way to go. And the ones that go down to the Yucatan, um, that means they have to come back over the Gulf of Mexico, which is an amazing flying feat. So amazing that until the middle of the 20th century, 
some people in the United States were sure that they migrated on the backs of Canada geese, uh, which is not true. But. Our next question is, um, I'll read it. I've been seeing a lot of red poles. Can you talk mm -hmm. about them? Where they come from and where they go after visiting us and how often do they show up? What a great question. We have been seeing lots of red poles also. Red poles are small birds. They're smaller than chickadees. They're named for the little red cap they have, like a little red beanie. And the adult males have pink breasts. The females and younger males don't have the pink breasts. And they are an eruption species. That's I-R-R. Um, they normally stay in Canada all year round. But in years where there hasn't been a very good cone or seed crop in Canada, they will come down into our area and spend much of the winter down here. Sort of like Vermonters going to Sarasota or something. I mean, they're just, just this comfy warm down here and has lots of food. The red poles we get down here tend to be mostly females and young males, although we still see some of the, the rosy breasted adult males. And they will stick around sometimes for only a few weeks, sometimes for a couple of months, and then head back to where they um, breed up in Canada. Um, this eruption happens irregularly. It's not like a regular migration. It happens every three, four, or five years. Um, and when it happens, some bird feeders can be overwhelmed. Uh, the last time this happened, several years ago, I tried to count, I came up with a count of 120 common red poles at our backyard feeders. It's almost impossible to count them because they never stop moving. Um, but this year we've got a flock that ranges between 25 and 60 every single day. <clears throat> Another question, but before I do it, I've had a reminder from one of the board members from Missisquoi. Um, and he would like to direct us to the fact that they are having a presentation on Thursday, Friends of Missisquoi's Bird Tales. And you can get information about that if you like at this website, friendsofmissisquoi.org. Thanks, Rich. Next question. I heard a cardinal singing this morning. Isn't it early? I used to think so. I used to think that bird song happened in the spring when birds recording. But I discovered several years ago, for instance, chickadees start that, hey birdie, in January some years, which I always called their spring song erroneously. We've heard a cardinal singing also, and for the last two mornings, morning doves have been cooing, which seems very strange and early. I guess it boils down to the fact that we humans really want things to be neat. We want things to be spring song and courtship song and etc. But the birds just do it when they feel like it. <laughs> and um, so yeah, it does feel early to me, but it doesn't to the birds. We've heard um, uh, Harry Woodpecker's drumming, which is very often a spring, a spring courtship behavior, a territorial behavior. And they very often start drumming in the January also. So they're just getting ready for the whole courtship and territory and breeding season. Next question, does the effect of global warming alter the migration of the birds and result in unusual appearance of birds not normally expected in our state? That is a good question and being studied. Um, in general, birds are triggered to migrate by the amount of light, the amount of light per day. They're not triggered by the fact that it's getting warmer. And that has led to some real problems because some birds come to Vermont at their regular time based on the, the length of the day. But some of the insects that some of those birds need to eat and to feed their young hatch out earlier now because of global warming. And so they get up here and there isn't as much for them to eat as they, as they need. And some of, that's one of the reasons suggested for the dying off of many birds. On the other hand, <laughs> Global warming might have something to do with the extension of some birds like tufted titmice into our area. No one's really sure why those birds have extended their, their range northward. It may also be because of the prevalence of uh, backyard 
feeders. Um, so there's a lot that people don't know about the effects of global warming. And I'm going to add one note. Um, it is an interesting when you bird in Florida, uh, mm -hmm. when there is a hurricane coming, the birders are excited for their birding expectations because as it happens, there are many, many birds that spend most of their lives out at sea and rarely are seen from the shore. Mm -hmm. But if there is a huge rainstorm or there's a hurricane and the wind is blowing, it gives all sorts of opportunities for some of these birds which are rarely seen from land to come into the shore. That happens even on the New England coast. So it is a, perhaps a, an incidental effect of global warming and not a cause effect. So we have a couple more questions and I'm going to move on. The next one is, are the window bird feeders with suction cups safe for birds? That's a good question. I actually don't know. We can't have them here because the giant fat squirrels um, weigh them down and they slide down off the windows. <laughs> um, if you get feeders that are too close to or too far away from your, your uh, windows, you increase the chances that the birds will fly into the windows or fly into the house if they're panicked by a predator. So there's a sort of sweet spot. I think it's three feet to 16 feet away from the window or something like that um, where feeders can be. <clears throat> but um, I've never heard of any danger from the window ones because they wouldn't be able to fly into the window well from there if they panic. I, I really don't know the answer to that. We certainly have an inquisitive bunch. We have many, many questions. So uh, I'm going to field some of those as well, Mav, if you don't mind. Oh, the next one is, where are some of the birding hotspots you mentioned? And before Mav answers, I'm going to tell you that there is an amazing tool you may have heard of or not heard of, uh, which was uh, created by Audubon and Cornell called eBird, E-B-I-R-D. And one of the features of that is that it gives all sorts of locations where many birders have gone and found many birds. So we refer to that normally as a birding hotspot. If you remember in the uh, fall, we had a presentation by Jacob Crawford on one of our local ones that he is developing called Saxon Hill Recreational Area. Maybe Mav can work that into her, her future presentations. Um, this is a really interesting question, and it's certainly not only for new birders, but um, can she suggest any bird guides for kids under 10 years old? Hmm. I don't know of children's bird guides. I think that the Sibley Guide and the um, National Geographic Guide are so beautiful and so good that any birder would like them, no matter what the age. Um, in my classes, I've had birders as young as seven. Um, that was the very youngest. And he had a, a Sibley that was dog-eared and beaten up and, and it worked well for him. So I don't, there may be some really beginning guides to like backyard birds, but if so, I, I haven't seen them. Well, we have a, a variety of questions and I, I'm going to apologize if I don't ask your particular question, but uh, I'm going to pick and choose now. Uh, this is an interesting one. Do any birds reuse their nests? Yes, most don't. <laughs> some do. And some actually use other birds' nests for the second time. Um, can't remember which kind of shorebird it is. There's, uh, It may be... I don't know what kind it is, that chooses that one of the few shorebirds that nests in trees way up uh, in, in northern Canada, and it always chooses the nests, leftover nests of other birds uh, to nest in. Um, robins don't reuse theirs. Um, Baltimore Orioles don't reuse theirs. Um, Eastern Phoebes normally don't, but we have had one in our barn, underneath our barn, who appeared to use part of the preceding year's nest um, in its new nest. It's a, it's a safety reason why most birds don't reuse them, by the way. A lot of nests by the end of the season are full of mites and, and lice and all sorts of other little parasites that can do damage to 
um, baby birds. So it's wise to start fresh every year. But again, some do reuse. And woodpeckers, um, other uh, cavity nesters, do tend to go to the same place over and over again. So it's a, it's a yes, no. Oh, and I should mention one more thing. Birds that make humongous nests, like ospreys and eagles, do reuse the same nest. When I was out west once, I saw a golden eagle nest that had been mentioned by Lewis and Clark, the same nest in the same place, and it was still in use, sort of growing every year. <clears throat> uh, this is really one of the benefits of this Zoom format. So uh, we have had an answer to the question about a guide for young birders by one of our participants, and I think it's a, an acquaintance and friend of ours, Grace Nelson, who says, there is a guide by Bill Thompson III, and the title of that guide is Young Birders Guide. So again, Young Birders Guide by Bill Thompson III has come recommended to us. A couple more questions. Um, one of these is, uh, I never see, I used to never see titmouses, but now they are one of the most common birds that are feeder. Why the change? And, and in answering that, Mav, uh, I'm going to take uh, the second part of your answer and talk about uh, some of the birds that we are now seeing in Vermont that were not seen 10 to 20 years ago. What do you have to say about titmouses? Titmice. Titmouse. <laughs> <laughs> Those little cute guys. Um, titmice are a great example. No one knows why they're expanding their range, but they are, and thank goodness. Carolina wrens, another bizarrely, um, sandhill cranes have shown up in Vermont, started showing up in Vermont in 2002. And now there are quite a few of them here and there tucked in. Um, and no one knows why that happened, whether that has to do with climate change or not. And it can be a really weird reason why birds change their, um, their range. The Eisenhower interstate system laid down a rolling smorgasbord of roadkill and turkey vultures expanded their range to take advantage of that. There were no turkey vultures seen in, in Vermont before the Eisenhower um, interstate program and now they're up here all the time. So many different things can, can bring creatures up. <laughs> um, Red-bellied woodpeckers didn't used to be around in Vermont and then they showed up in southern Vermont and then they started showing up in the Shelburne area. And now they haven't yet reached Jericho Center, but they've been seen in Richmond and Underhill. So any day now. I see one every day now, Mav. I, I, I will uh, leave a little note oh. on the suet feeder of the neighbor and send it up. Um, one Thank thing you. I think that's very <laughs> surprising to me as a birder is that in the 1960s and 70s, there were no cardinals in Vermont. So the fact that cardinals, a bird that we almost take for granted and they're ubiquitous, at one time there weren't any cardinals in Vermont. This is yet an earlier version of an expansion. Mav mentioned turkey vultures, but we have now in the last two or three years had another species of vulture, the black vulture. In fact, today there were three of them that were seen um, by a birder and posted on eBird. So uh, as time goes on, I think we're going to see more and more of the birds expand their range. All right, let's get to another question. Um, this one is an interesting one, and uh, I'm going to see how you feel that, Mav. Do you ever collect bird feathers? Well, it's illegal to collect bird feathers um, at all, <laughs> except if they're going to be used for educational purposes. So when I started giving bird talks, well, the one that my talk about sound, I wanted to have feathers so that we could show the difference between feathers that are designed to make sound, like the feathers on a woodcock's tail, and birds that and feathers that are designed to muffle sound, like on an owl. And I called Fish and Wildlife, and they said, well, the, the correct answer is that it's completely illegal. But of course you can. So <laughs> So I do have a small collection of feathers. The reason why it was made illegal was to guard against um, horrible feather taking, like such as happened at the end of the 1800s, when 
great egrets and snowy egrets were decimated because ladies liked plumes in their hats. Um, and that the, the rebellion and repulsion and revulsion against that sort of led to a, a very draconian law. No, you're not supposed to collect feathers, but. The next question is interesting. The birds that we see in the spring, are they the same exact birds that are here year after year? Good question. I had that wonder about robins once, because robins, we see robins in the, in the winter here. Um, and yet that is considered a migratory species. So some banding has suggested that the birds that we see, um, the birds that appear to be year round might not be the same birds, the same exact individuals. Blue jays also migrate, which is something I didn't know until fairly recently. So that the blue jays that we're seeing in the winter might not be the ones that nested here. So whether they're the same as year after year, if it's a species that nests in Vermont and is hatched in Vermont and doesn't leave Vermont, yes, the chickadees that we see today are going to be the same chickadees we see two weeks from now and four weeks from now and eight weeks from now and until they die. Um, but for many other species that isn't the case. So it's another one of those yes and no questions, or answers rather. And an interesting species that does come back and uh, Greenmont Audubon is a partner with uh, a professor at the New England uh, University and that is the bobolinks. And mm -hmm. bobolinks actually uh, have been banded and when they do come back into the field to build their nest, it, it seems like they come back into the very same field and as they expand, they might go to the next field. So I'm gonna take two more questions. And this one is, do some owls nest in old crow or squirrel nests? I don't know. Um, I've seen great horned owls nest in very odd places. I've, I've seen a great horned owl nest in a nest that was used by great horned owls in the winter and red-tailed hawks in the summer for many, many years. I don't know which bird actually built the original nest. Um, I've seen a great horned owl nesting just flat on the flat piece of a cut-off stump. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if they nested in crow nests, but I have never seen that myself or heard about it myself. Do you know, Tom? I actually don't know the answer, but that's one of the interesting things about learning more about bird behavior and habitat is I'm sure that somebody out there knows the answer. Yes. I have one last comment, and this isn't a question, but it's a comment by uh, a participant, and I'm going to use it as a closing remark. It says to Mav, you inspired us to get out our bird seed and fill up the feeder again. And what I'm going to morph that into is, Mav, Kim, you have inspired us tonight with your presentation and uh, have filled us up with the beauty of nature and the possibility of birding. So we thank you on behalf of the Programs Committee of the Green Mountain Audubon Society. Everyone, our next presentation is scheduled for February 9th. Please join us. And also, if you have time, uh, check out the pro program that's going to be presented up at the Friends of Missisquoi. I wish all of you a good evening. I thank you one and all. Good birding. Get out there. Thank you, Tom.